The give all you heard the Jewish people accept it upon themselves. What did they accept upon themselves? That which they had begun to do. What did they start to do? Accepting the Torah in Harsina. Why is it specifically Perm that finished the acceptance of the Torah? Because the giving of the Torah were at physical heights. We're free, we're free. And we're at spiritual heights, the great revelations, everything's going on. So, of course, it should have been completed then. Why is it being completed at Purim? Remember, the question comes up because God held the mountain over them. It says, like a tub, where he said, if you don't accept this, I'm going to drop the mountain. So, there's the claim that there could have been coercion. So, that's why it wasn't full acceptance. That's where the whole question comes up in. So, when they're looking at the text in the McGill, like here was full acceptance. What culminated the giving of the Torah? Because Purim, they had active mysterious nefesh, as in self sacrifice. Mordechai, who is the most rebane of the generation, awakened that within the people. Specifically, he gathered 22,000 students and he taught them we saw text supporting all this so basically what is it about perm that finished culminated the giving of the chart as in now we are not coerced we have volunteered fully to take this upon ourselves that is perm because they had active of serious fish questions why we're we talking about mordechai and school children that seems a by the way why are we comparing the physical state of the jewish people of perm and giving of the Torah? it should just be a spiritual thing why are we so focused on mysterious nefesh that's one mitzvah out of many also you're supposed to live for the mitzvah and perm and hanukkah both times that the jewish people had to risk themselves for keeping Torah. what is it about perm not just because chronologically it came first there's something about perm lots of text about mysterious nefesh and we said okay now we have to understand what the giving of the Torah is all about what was the purpose of it not just to tell us the laws we knew a lot of them the forefathers kept the torah when yaakov ran away to love after he took the blessings, when Yaakov ran away, he studied for 14 years at the yeshiva Shem and Aver. Shem yes. is where we come from. So that's Noach's son, Shem, Cham, and Yafes, Shem. Shem. His descendant is Aver, so Shem and Aver had a yeshiva teaching about God. So Yaakov studied at the yeshiva Shem and Aver, so they studied the God's wisdom of the Torah. The Torah was in the world. What was the difference about Harsina is that now the Torah can actually affect the world. Spiritual and the physical can now merge. They're not two opposite ends of the magnet anymore. How do two opposites unite? Something third brings them together. We took this idea about both sides have to subjugate themselves to something bigger than they. And we applied it to different things with mitzvahs, and we're getting into the whole thing with Torah study. Three aspects of the mitzvah after the giving of the Torah, the lower aspect, what we call tachton, physical stays physical. Elia on the higher aspect, with spiritual stays spiritual, and bottles, when the two of them now merge, they come together. For example, in the fulfilling a mitzvah, if you have the lower level of fulfilling a mitzvah, the tachton, the physical level, that is when it's out of habit, motivated by the body and the animal soul. So your body has been trained to do what it's supposed to do. Elion, then we have the higher aspect, that's the desire to connect to God, motivated by the love of the soul. So I love God so much, I'm going to connect with him. That's why I'm going to do the mitzvos. And then Batal, the subjugated aspect, is that we do the mitzvos because God commanded them and we are nullified, subjugated to God. As in, I put my own self aside. It's not about what my body is habituated to. It's not about where my level of love is. It's just about the fact that God gave the mitzvah and so I do the mitzvah. So because yeah, now that's a higher level that we can reach. Lots of texts. Then we got to three approaches to mitzvah. Lower aspect is that mitzvahs were given to refine man and creation. Every mitzvah corresponds to one of the limbs of the body. And by the way, when they say limbs, we say there's two 248 limbs and 365 organs. It's not like the way you'd see it in an anatomy textbook. They're kind of broad translations of it. That's when we saw the text about why does God care how you shech an animal like this or like this. It's because it's all about the refinement for us. Mitzvahs were given to walk in Hashem's way, to connect with Him in levels above creation. So God does the mitzvahs, then He commands it to us. He tells us to do it. So this is how we follow along now according to God by doing as He does. That's why we do the mitzvahs. And then the battle levels that yeah, mitzvahs, sounds, they make man significance and they connect us to the essence of the commander. Mitzvahs is the language of tafsa and chibor, language of connection. Then we got to the motivation of Torah learning. Tacht on the lower aspect, that is motivated by the intellect. This is interesting. This is smart stuff. That's why I study Torah. And anybody, regardless of their spiritual level, can study Torah from that level. If you're intellect, you're an intellect. Interesting is interesting. Ali on the higher level, benefit of the soul, motivated by the neshama to connect to Hashem. So kind of like with the mitzvah, that love of God is what drives me. The soul drives me to connect to God. That's why I study Torah. But the level, the subjugate level, what's the level above those two? There's no motivation but for the sake of Torah itself. You study Torah because Torah has to be studied. This is where we ended last time. That a person can give himself over to learning without any countings, with unlimited dedication, and there's no goal to be attained but learning with complete bittal, free from ulterior motives. So we understand that study of Torah is that we have acquired God. The language that it's used is vaikuli turma, they take unto me a turma, a gift. As in, we actually take God. Torah study is like we actually took God. When God gave us the Torah, God's giving us himself. This brings us now to the three approaches to Torah. These are the last two sets of three. Three approaches to Torah study. Torah is the wisdom of Hashem, which descends to a level for human intellect. So what drives me? Because I know that God has taken his wisdom and put it into a format that I can study down here. Torah is a tool and it means to connect with Hashem. You see, they're very similar to the ones that we've said already. And Torah is one with the essence of Hashem. Okay. 
Next, three approaches to learning halacha. Learning the actual halacha, the law, not just Torah in general, but learning the law. You study with a primary focus on practical halachas. The lower level, the lower motivation is studying just, well, I gotta know what to do. So let's learn what we're supposed to do. Alion is to study, the higher level is to study the whole Torah regardless of practical application. It's not just about whatever I need to know, it's just I gotta study the whole Torah, I'm gonna study the whole Torah. Batal, the higher level, is study to meditate on Torah day and night without any goal save the study of Torah. Either I'm gonna study Torah just because I have to know the laws, I gotta know what I'm supposed to be doing. Or the higher level is like, okay, I'm just going to learn all the Torah because we've got to study the whole Torah. The higher level of both of those, as in taking both of those and taking them to the next level, is just studying Torah day and night without any specific goal. doesn't matter how much of the Torah I've learned. doesn't even matter what level I'm on. It's just constant Torah study. Think about Torah a lot. There's always a time for studying. So top in the lower aspect. Study with a primary focus on practical halachas. That is the requirement to study the practical areas of halacha to know what to do with focus on physical action. What's the level of Torah study I'm going to do to know what I'm supposed to be doing? So this is Shulchan Aruch Harav. That means that's the Alter Rabbi Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Yosef Kairo he wrote the first Shulchan Aruch. People have counted mitzvahs and things like that, but what we call the Shulchan Aruch, where Yosef Cairo wrote the first one. Who was just telling me that there was another rabbi of the time who lived in a different area who did the exact same thing? He also set out to codify all the laws and things like that. Not just to count mitzvahs, but to codify the actual laws. And then he found out about Rabbi Yosef Cairo's version. And he saw it, and he basically took his entire life work and ripped it up. And he said, he did a better job than me, and he basically just ripped up his whole life work. Can you imagine having that level of the humility of saying, like, oh, you did a better job. I will take what I've been working on my entire life and just forget it. We don't need this. Anyway, the Alter Rebbe also wrote a Shulchan Aruch. The Alter Rebbe put together, compiled the three books. The Tanya, which is philosophy. Siddur, which is speech. And then Halacha, which is action. Shulchan Aruch, the thought, speech, and action. The three garments of the soul. There is a book that the Alter Rebbe put together for each of them. So this is from the Alter Rebbe's Shulchan Aruch. If one must attend to an urgent matter directly after the morning prayers and wishes to borrow this time from a fixed time slot for Torah study and repay it later in the day or at night, this is permitted. Nevertheless, it is desirable that one study even a single law or verse directly after morning davening. Even a person who does not know how to study should attend the house of study who will assuredly be rewarded for having gone there. Alternatively, he should establish a fixed place and briefly review there is something that he knows. While sitting there, he should implant the fear of heaven in his heart and examine his conduct. Perhaps he will find there a sinful aspect from which he should withdraw. What this part of the Shulchan Aruch is bringing down, it's showing us a basic love of Torah study, of just making sure that you get it in there. It fits more the practical halachas version of, I'm just going to get a little bit of Torah study in, not reaching the higher levels of more learning. Okay, here's Tanya. Mitzvahs performed with thought and speech only cause the light of the Shekhinah to rest upon the divine soul. Drawing this light upon the body and upon the animal soul requires mitzvahs involving action, whereby man harnesses the power of the animal life-giving soul. Remember how we always saw in Tanya, what's more important? Mitzvahs are more important. Torah is more important. Mitzvahs are more important. Torah is more important. Then the final thing was do the mitzvahs, because action is what impacts this world. However, in order to draw the light and rain into the Shekhinah upon his body and animal souls as well, i.e. upon the vitalizing soul, vitalizing soul, animal soul, natural soul, vivifying soul, actually clothed in the body and providing for a corporeal life force, one must fulfill the practical mitzvahs, which are performed with the body itself. In this way, the actual power of the body engaged in this act, e.g. the physical strength in his arm that impels the motions that fulfill the mitzvah, is absorbed in the divine light and will and merges with it in perfect unity. This power of the body constitutes the third garment of the divine soul. As in, if you're just going to study Torah, that's your thought and your speech that get affected. When you do a mitzvah with action, this arm now is going to be absorbed within the light, physically impacting when you do action mitzvah. When the faculty of action is absorbed within the divine will, because remember, every mitzvah is a vessel for God's will. So when the faculty of action is absorbed within the divine will, then in addition, the power of the vitalizing soul actually clothed within the body, the power of that soul derived from Klippanoga is transformed from evil to good and is actually absorbed into holiness exactly like the divine soul. For it is the power of the animal soul that implements and performs the act that constitutes the mitzvah. When you do a mitzvah with your body, what actually gives your body life on the literal level is your animal soul. And that's why it's also called the natural soul or the vitalizing soul, etc. When you do the mitzvah, because it's that soul that's driving the mitzvah, even though it's inspired, per se, by the godly soul, even though it's inspired by that, the life of the body is still driven by the animal soul. So that is why the animal soul gets elevation through doing the mitzvah, filled with the same kind of godly light that the, that the godly soul would be filled with. True, the divine soul is the force motivating observance of a mitzvah, yet the divine soul cannot directly activate the body to perform a physical action. It can accomplish this only through the animal soul, which serves as a medium between the divine soul and the body. The godly soul is what wants to do the mitzvah. It's not such a great translation, godly soul. But you have to think of it, it's not about where it comes from, it's about what its driving force is. Because all souls come from God. And so we have three souls. You have an animal soul, an intellectual soul, and what we call the godly soul. The godly soul because it's God-oriented. The intellectual soul is intellect-oriented. So that's where any kind of philosophy would come from. And the animal soul is just more like nature-oriented. 
you. That's what's called the natural soul. So whatever just basic life functioning is where that is. True, your mitzvah is driven by the divine soul, but your godly soul can't do anything without a body. And the body is, is given life by the animal soul. Anybody who's up in Gan in the highest heights, they can be way holier than everybody else, but they can't do a mitzvah if they're not in the body. We're the ones in the body that can do the mitzvah. For without this power of the animal soul, the divine soul would not affect the body at all, since it is spiritual and the body physical and corporeal. So that body and divine soul are antithetical, as are the spiritual material dimensions generally. The intermediary between them is the vitalizing animal soul clothed in man's blood, which is in the heart and throughout his body. The animal soul acts as the bridge between the divine soul and the body. And if you remember, its headquarters is in the heart because the heart pumps blood to the rest of the body and blood is life. That's also your emotion center, your passion center. So that's why that's where the animal soul is. The nature of the animal soul is such that the coarsest, most material-like level of its spiritual substance is capable of clothing itself within the blood. Since the animal soul is the divine soul's medium of affecting the body, its active power is also absorbed into holiness and performing the mitzvah. So the animal soul gets fully enclosed, enveloped in divine light when it does the mitzvah because through it, that is how the divine soul does a mitzvah. This is specifically talking about action-oriented mitzvahs, which is what this lower level is about, learning halacha so that you can do the action-oriented mitzvah. That's tough on the lower aspect. Now let's look at Elyon, the higher aspect, that we study to regards to the practical application, as in not just studying the halachas that I need to know what actions to do, but also I'm just going to study the whole Torah because all of Torah must study. It's a mitzvah to know the whole Torah, even areas without practical application. If you ever heard of the mitzvah of the Ben Sar Mur, it's called the rebellious son. There's certain qualifications for it, but the end result of it is that the parents have to stone him. He has come to a point where the Torah just writes him off, which is kind of unusual for the Torah to do, but it does. But even though you have that law, it's in Tanakh, it's in the actual Torah, but they say that it never came to pass. All the qualifications that have to be met never happen, but yet we still study it because it's still God's Torah. So even though this mitzvah never happened, but we still study if something like this would come to pass, now we know how God wants us to behave according to it. Though the depth of Torah is infinite, halachas, midrashim, gemaras, etc., studied by a finite being or also finite in numbers. So the entire Torah can be and has been learned. So there's a mitzvah to know the whole Torah. Can you study the whole Torah? Depth-wise, no. We can never reach the depths. It's God's wisdom. It's infinity. But practically speaking, can I study the whole Tanakh, Gemara, Mishnah, all the books? Yeah, practically you could. It has been done before. So that would be the higher level. I will just study the entire Torah, all of it. I will know all of it. Isn't that what we strive to do every year? Like, just read? Like... That's the five books. Here it's talking about not only the five books. When you hear Laning and Shul, that's only the five books. Haftar takes parts of Navi, but it's not all of Navi. So you'd have to study all that and also so the whole Tanakh and then plus all the oral law that comes along with it. And the oral law is... The oral law is, let's, Gemara, Mishnah, all that is oral law. Midrashim, it's all oral law. Now it's all in text, but it started off orally. That it was, was never supposed to be written down. If you have to transmit it orally, uh -huh. it forces you to, you must teach it. And then eventually we were in different places and things are changing and Rabbi Huda and us, he was like, that's it, we got to write it down. But it's still called oral law. Yes, because it's still not the Tanakh. So there are some who are like, I don't believe in the oral law, I only do the written law. How do you know what the written law says if you don't know what the oral law is? For example, the oral law is what tells you that an alpha is an alpha and a base is a base. There's a story with Hillel. He's like, I only want to learn the written law. Don't tell me the oral law. So Hillel is like, fine. This is an olive, base, give an olive, base, give a dollar. Okay, great. Come back tomorrow. Come back the next day. Same letters. This is a dollar. This is a base. This is an olive. This is a game. Wait, that's all you said yesterday. Well, how are you supposed to know what I'm saying? Don't you see why you have to trust the oral law? Because I can make anything up. The way that we know how to read the Torah comes all the way from Moshe Rabbeinu. The fact that we read the Torah the way we read it now comes from Moshe. It's being transmitted from there to say, Barashas Bar Elokim. It's like a 3,500 year old yeah, tradition or something. Totally, yeah. You can do the math on it. We're in the year 5784 and it was given 2448. So about 3,500 years ago, give or take. Yeah, and yeah, you have to so. remember that at minimum, 2 million people witnessed the giving of the Torah. Yeah, we're the only ones who really claim to such things. It's a pretty good track record That's of gods. There's also an idea boy. that there are certain parts of the oral law that were expanded as the years went on, not because new things were necessarily discovered, but because certain things were more understood then. So God just like told him everything. He taught him everything. Remember day and night he studied. Remember he was like an angel. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep. Remember we learned in the Michamocha at nighttime I was sitting and a day I was standing and that's the Rinlan Oral Law. We don't know why it's connected, but that's what it is. Day and night are written on Oral Law. I've seen the Ten Commandments. The Charlton <clears throat> Heston one, but also the Prince of Egypt cartoon. The Prince oh, of I Egypt is, Prince is horrific. You know they, how wrong they got that story? They did, but it's There's so like no good, part of it that's correct. So he studied... 40 days and 40 nights listening and God's just telling him. In the Torah, there are times when questions come up and Moshe turns to God to say, what's the ruling on this? The joke is that they call it wandering in the desert and they actually didn't wander. They followed the clouds. Right, God told them here's yeah. where to go. One of the examples of the daughters of Tzlafchad, there were five girls, there were boys in the family and they went to Moshe and said, we want to inherit. We want a piece of the land of Israel. So they turned Good. to God and God said, yes, they get to inherit. And that is through them because of their love for the land of Israel. This law is taught through them who came to Moshe to say... No, this is about inheriting the land. So Pinchas was when Zimri and Cusby, Bilam, after he did not succeed in cursing the Jewish people, he said, okay, here's what you got to do. You got to get them to sin. You got to send the girls out and you got to get them to sin. Like there was a Nasi, the head of the tribe of Shimon, took a Moabite 
Cusby. She was a princess. Which also just goes to show that how much the Moabite hated the Jewish people that they sent their own princesses out. In front of Moshe, in front of the whole camp, he said, is she forbidden to me? So Moshe said, yeah. He's like, well, you married somebody from well, Midnight. Well, that was also before the Torah, etc. So he just took her. He's like, okay, bye. And he went to go, you know. Pinchas stood up then and he said, Moshe, you got to do something. So that's why they said, um, can I in You got to act. And it says the one who is zealous in this thing was the one who will carry out the ruling. So that's when Pinchas took the spear and he speared through both of them, basically. He killed them both. And because of that, he became a Conan. He was from the family of Aaron, but when the decision was like, okay, Aaron, from now on, your family will be priests. Pinchas was already born. It was whoever was coming after that. So he basically missed the cutoff. He was born too early. So once he did that, part of the reward, because there was a plague that swept through, he cooled God's anger. So God, as a reward, gave him kuhuna. He made him a priest. Okay, this is from Eov. Eov is Job. Eruka merits midah or chava yam. Longer than the earth is its measure and wider than the sea. So it's using this verse to describe Torah. Wide and so much of it. But again, we could study it all. Shulchan Aruch Harad. Back to the altar of the Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish law. A person should not say, how is it possible for me to study the entire oral law? For the Torah has no end or limit. It is written to every limit. I have seen an end, but your commandment is exceedingly expansive. And so is it written, its measure is longer than the earth. That's referring back to the verse that we just saw from Eov. This is not a valid objection. You're going to say, how can I ever study Torah? It's too much. It's too much. And the altar is like, no. No excuses. For in truth, the laws which have been revealed to us and our descendants have a finite bound, limited number. As in, there is a set amount of laws. You could actually study all the laws. This is also true of the interpretations that have been revealed to us. This applies even to the simple expositions encoded in it. As our sages relate, Rabbi Kiva would derive mounds upon mounds of laws from every tiny crown atop the letters of the Torah. And even then, he did not exhaust the concepts that could be derived. The depths of Torah is infinite, but the widths of Torah is finite enough for us to be able to study all of it. And we're actually going to look at the Gemara that talks about how Rabbi Kiva would derive mounds upon mounds of laws. And you know what we're talking about the crown because the way that the text looks in the Torah has those little like lines on top of it the Torah text those are called the crowns similarly there are no bounds or limits to the depths of the rationales for the laws so the depth is where there's no limit because it's infinite the dialectical analysis of their motivating principles and the derivation of concepts through the principles of biblical exegesis in this manner an unlimited number of new laws will further be derived by those who merit this rung of study after having concluded the study of the entire Torah law that was transmitted and revealed to all depth wise it could go forever someone who could study the whole Torah will I might actually uncover more depth wise this sequence to learn and develop new ideas is alluded to by our sages a person should study and then contemplate the latter referring to the in-depth analysis of the motivating principles underlying the laws as will be explained. Basically, the elder is saying you shouldn't make excuses like, oh, I can never study the oral law. There's so much of it. No excuses. You gotta do what you gotta do. Width-wise, it's like a seed. There's an end to it. Depth-wise, is forever. This will finish off with the Gemara that it, it talks about how Rabbi Akiva would derive mounds upon mounds of laws from every tiny crown atop the letters of the Torah. One of the things that Rabbi Akiva was known for teaching is that each crown, he had all these interpretations for that. So this is from Menachos, it's part of the Gemara, the Talmud. Rabbi Yehuda says, the Rav says, when Moshe ascended on high, he found the Holy One, blessed be he, sitting and tying crowns on the letters of the Torah. Moshe said before Hashem, Master of the Universe, who is preventing you from giving the Torah without these additions? As in, when Moshe went up to get the Torah, he sees God putting crowns on all the letters. And Moshe's like, why are we doing this? Hashem said to him, there is a man who is destined to be born after several generations, and Akiva ben Yosef is his name. He is destined to derive from each and every thorn of these crowns, mounds upon mounds of halacha. It is for his sake that the crowns must be added to the letters of the Torah. Moses says, God, why are you tying all these crowns up? Why can't you just get the Torah? No, there's going to be someone named Akiva ben Yosef. The amount of interpretation is going to derive from this. For this, it's worth it to tie all these crowns on. So Moses is very impressed. Moses said before Hashem, Master of the universe, show him to me. Hashem said to him, return behind you. Moshe went and sat at the end of the eighth row in Rabbi Kiva's study hall and did not understand what they were saying. Moshe's strength waned as he thought his, his turn knowledge was deficient. He was kind of sad. When Rabbi Kiva arrived at the discussion of one matter, his student said to him, my teacher, from where do you derive this? Rabbi Kiva said to them, it is halacha transmitted to Moshe from Sinai. When Moshe heard this, his mind was put at ease. And this too is part of the Torah that he used to receive. So first Moshe hears the Rabbi Kiva's teaching and Moshe says, what is all this Torah that I don't even know what this is? Then Rabbi Kiva says, no, this is also for Moshe at Mount Sinai. And Moshe was, was like, all right. Moshe returned and came before the home of Best Behead and said before him, Master of the universe, you have a man as great as this and yet you still choose to give the Torah through me? Why? Hashem said to him, be silent, this intention arose before me. Can you imagine how humble Moshe was that he was chosen to receive the Torah and after he sees Rabbi Kiva, he goes back to God and he says, give the Torah through him. Me? Give it to him. But he's not alive yet. As in, you you could have made him be alive instead of me. Oh. Moshe is saying, why do you need me if you had him? You don't need me, you have him. And Hashem says, quiet, this is my decision. No. Just to end on a happy note, I didn't put in the second part. The second part is that Moshe says, wow, can you show me the reward of such a person? And it says that he saw a butcher shop because Rabbi Kiva, if you remember, his ending was that he was burnt in a Sefer Torah. The Romans burnt him in a Sefer Torah. And Moshe said to God, this is Torah, this is its reward. How can this be his end? And God said, quiet, this is my will. Same, Same line, God. quiet, this is my will. While Rabbi Kiva was being burned, he lived to 120 also. As he was burning, he said Shema, but such a level, and his students were like, really? 
Rabbi Kiva said, all my life I wanted to be able to experience true self-sacrifice. That and I've married it. Shema with like our dying breath. Like. Shema in general is the prayer of martyrs because it affirms God's oneness. It actually draws a distinction, well, draw between Rabbi Kiva and Avraham. Avraham also had Messiah Savage, of course. But the difference between Avraham, who had also, he was put in the furnace and the murder of man after he destroyed all the idols. Avram wasn't looking for Messiah Snefesh. If I have to have Messiah Snefesh, I'll have it. Avram wasn't looking for it. Rabbi Kiva was looking for it. So, so he's still not Avram. All these people are on these untouchable levels. Like these levels are so far removed. But by the way, they're still not on this still... level. There's a reason the forefathers are the forefathers. There's a reason why Moshe is Moshe. We can't reach those levels. And every generation afterwards is a little bit of a level less than the generation that came before it. Which is very distinct than people saying that we all came from a bunch of monkeys. We all came from a bunch of monkeys that I'm more human than you. Why should I have to respect you? But we're recognizing that every generation that came before us was that much greater. So that's why we look at these generations and we're like, wow. But even among them, we see that. Even though they do say that Moshe was shown all the generations to the end of time and then he saw this generation and he's like how are they going to do it he was just in awe how are they going to hold on this generation this generation because there's so much going on in this world moshe saw all the challenges and how much we would not see we don't see all the miracles of that time we do not have the godly revelations of the previous generations and yet you have a jew today that identifies as a jew that goes to shul and shabbos that will do the torah mitzvahs how can you conceptualize how someone can still do that after all the years and after everything that they're still committed and holding on we're midgets on the shoulders of giants the giant still needs the midget for the last few inches